The summer travel season is nearly here, which means millions of people will be heading for national parks and national forests. As it turns out, a few of them won't be coming back. Each year, hundreds of people are reported missing in our parks and forests. Most are eventually found, but there's a smaller category of cases that never get solved, including a few close to home. The I team's George Knapp is here with the story. George. You know, it's not a revelation to say that people get lost out in the wilderness or in forest areas. We're talking about a different kind of mystery, though. Disappearances that are not caused by predator attacks or criminals hiding out there in the woods or just bad luck. A former cop has put together hundreds of case files regarding clusters of missing persons in national parks where the circumstances are flat out strange. But don't expect any answers from the Park Service. At the end of the night, I was staying in a, a motel off the government or off the Park Service land. I get a knock on the door. The person who confided in law enforcement veteran David Politis was a government employee who told one heck of a story about people who vanish in national parks, places like Yosemite, but also national forests, including the Toyabe, west of Las Vegas. In the years since the knock at the door, Politis has scoured small-town newspaper archives and pestered federal agencies for records. He found so many cases of missing people that a planned book became two, filled with more than 400 cases of people who went into national parks but never came out. People disappear in the wilds all the time, and we're talking about something different. These were unusual things that don't make sense that happen to cluster together cluster together in three to four, sometimes as many as 20, 30 people missing at one location. The individual cases are strange enough, Politis says, but stranger still were the reactions of federal agencies when he asked for public records. And when we FOIA'd them, we got a response back that they don't keep any lists of missing people. The response was not only no, but hell no, he says. So he began putting his own list together and discovered what appears to be nearly 30 clusters of disappearances in national parks and forests, cases which meet a narrow set of odd characteristics. The people who vanish often do so right under the noses of others. In many cases of kids, their parents' noses. Being parents and being responsible people, we understand there's no way my son or daughter wouldn't know the way back from being just down the road getting the ball. But it happens all the time. It happens all the time. The missing defy logic. They hike uphill, for instance, often steep climbs. Children as young as two or three are found a day or two later many miles away and over mountain ranges. Some kids are found in phenomenal distances away that would make no logical sense to any parent. Weird things happen to their clothing. The missing often shed their clothes right away, even in bad weather. Clothes are found sometimes neatly folded, but not the people. The ranger described to me, if you were standing straight up and you just had your shirt or just had your pants on and you melted directly into your pants, that's what it looked like to him. The pants were laying on the ground in a very neat pile. The missing defy normal search and rescue practices. Bodies are found in places that are all but inaccessible, or they're found in the open, in areas that were repeatedly searched earlier. Bloodhounds or other tracker dogs are often befuddled. If the dog can't find a scent, that's a red flag. If a dog, a canine dog, a trained dog, is put on the scent at the point last seen, and it lays down and it doesn't want to track anymore, red flag. And that happens more than you think. Nevada doesn't have a major cluster, but it has plenty of cases. Children who vanished around Lake Tahoe, in the center of the state near Tonopah, and at Mount Charleston. In 1966, six-year-old Larry Jeffrey of Henderson disappeared while playing with his two brothers, setting off a massive 16-day search by as many as a thousand men. Former Sheriff Ralph Lamb remembers it clearly. Walked away from camp. Never did hear from him, never did see him, never did find him. We had hundreds of people there working, almost shoulder to shoulder. There's no large predators per se. Um, so we can't worry about mammals taking him. And he was in a fairly remote area where there's no vehicular access, so there's no car abduction. This boy just walked into oblivion. And in, a, in an age where you have aircraft up looking for the boy. You have 800 people scouring the mountain. You should be able to find him. That coupled with, if he was deceased, part of that uh, ongoing effort is bringing in cadaver dogs. The odor coming off the body, they should have found that. They didn't. 
Other aspects of this mystery are even more bizarre, though difficult to explain in just a couple of minutes. Example, many of the vanished who are found alive are kids, too young to speak, or kids who can't communicate because of disabilities. Some who are found alive say they can't remember what happened to them. In his books, David Politis reports on why some obvious explanations simply don't apply here, but he stops short of giving his own theory or explanation. Politis says he doesn't want to scare people away from visiting parks, but thinks people need to be made aware. A month ago, we asked the Park Service and the Forest Service for their lists of local missing persons cases. Still waiting. We have links and more information about all this stuff on our website. Check it out. Fair. Hundreds of thousands of people visit national parks each year. But you might not realize that a number of those people go missing. Yep. That's the focus of a brand new book. It's called Missing 411. Retired police officer David Politis is here. He logged more than 7,000 hours to investigate the disappearances. Disappearances of 411 people from national parks. Good morning, David. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So seven years it took you to research all of this. And, and when I first thing I saw in this book we were looking at, and she mm -hmm. read a good portion of it, I was able to skim it. The first thing that jumped out to me was clusters. Mm -hmm. What does exactly does that mean when it comes to this book here? So during the research of finding missing people that disappeared in the rural areas of North America, including Canada, we found that there were 28 different clusters of missing people, geographical clusters, uh, that were never talked about and never known before. And that was a, it was a highly unusual find on our part. Was it something it wasn't talked about because no one had ever really discovered the relationship between all of the disappearances and you kind of found that there were these clusters that had something in common? There, there isn't a lot of statistical data or a lot of uh, public data that's available on missing people, especially historical data that maybe goes back 100 years. And putting the pieces together to see that the clusters come together and there is historical significance to it is something you don't hear about. We, we didn't understand it when we started. I was so surprised uh, to find out that one of the longest list of people missing is actually from Yosemite, right, for the, or for the western region, in fact, and, you know, it's so close to us, and I, I was just there in January, hard to believe, and you say that it's actually been difficult to get some information about the missing cases. So when we started the project, we understood that uh, the National Park System has a large law enforcement presence, mm -hmm. and law enforcement is known to keeping a lot of data missing people, homicides, robbery, etc. Well, so we, uh, we attempted to get uh, information from them through the use of Freedom of Information Act. And we filed dozens of Freedom of Information Act requests for this data. We got information back that they didn't keep lists of missing people locally at Yosemite or at any other national park and from, at a national level. And when we requested the data, the National Parks came back and stated that they were going to charge us $34,000 for a list of missing people from Yosemite, wow. and they wanted $1.4 million for a list of missing people nationally. And they stated that they just don't keep that data. That's kind of shocking because yeah. it would seem to me like it, it makes sense that a park, a national park of mm -hmm. this size, would be probably the first place where people would go missing. You would need that information. But no, not so much. I think that they have the information. They, they don't want the public to know the information mm -hmm. at this point. And we work with guys that are heads of large law enforcement departments in the United States. And, and their statement to me was, these people are not stupid. Yeah. They understand the need to keep this information. They just don't want to give it up at this point. Exactly. I, and you said, I was reading in the beginning here, that you actually, this started, this all started just a conversation that you had with the ranger several years back. Several years ago, about three and a half, four years ago, a ranger came up to me and said, hey, there's some disappearances at several parks I've worked at. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody needs to take a hard look at it because the, when the people disappear, there's a lot of publicity on the front end. Right. Soon after they kind disappear, you don't hear anything. Uh, there are some young, young kids under 10 years old that are missing from national parks. You never hear about mm -hmm. them. Once they're gone, they're gone. They don't give them a lot of publicity. And it's a very disturbing fact. Mm -hmm. It is indeed, and you, you not only give lists, but you also you give pictures, pictures and, and identities actual, of all these yeah, people. unbelievable. And again, you can all find this, Missing 411, the Western United States and Canada. And hopefully we can use some of the information from this book to eventually get to the point where we're able to find ways to, to protect people more. Like, your book doesn't do that, but the information that's in this book can help lead to that. Walk in pairs, mm -hmm. keep your friends close, yeah. keep your kids very close. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. David, David. thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank we appreciate that. Thank you very much. A lot of hard work came to fruition.
Iroquois lore speaks of the Janosqua, a stone giant with rock-hard skin that preyed on Native American villages. They would attack a village and kill everyone and eat them. They would have like a communal feast on the victims. Although the Janosqua has a very different temperament than its Sasquatch cousin, the two have remarkably similar physical characteristics. Eyewitnesses have described the creature as a seven to eight foot tall, gray colored overgrown monkey with a humanoid simian face. The bulk of evidence showing the existence of this elusive creature comes from plaster casts of found footprints reaching 18 inches long. And for hikers and outdoorsmen across North America, Janosqua encounters have become more and more commonplace. We locked eyes. I looked into his eye, eyes that looked kind of red. Then it got up on two legs and it like it just ran. It was just one of those moments like kind of like that'd be like on the X Files or something. And for those who find themselves face to face with this bloodthirsty creature, the end result can be devastating. Janosqua killed their prey by basically twisting their head to the point of decapitating the victim. They literally twist the head right off the body. Well, the Janosqua is like a very hairy creature, similar to a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a Yeti. The one main difference, though, is its actual skin, which has a very hard, slate, stone-like appearance, which most people feel is from the Janosqua rolling around in the sand and the dirt uh, very regularly. The skin almost takes on an armor-like appearance. It's, uh, it, it appears like it's basically made out of stone. There's a very strong odor associated with the Janosqua. You know, there's no showers in the forest, so unfortunately uh, these creatures and beasts smell very horrible, and there's some accounts of it sort of smelling like a mixture between a skunk and a rotting corpse. The origin of this odor is two things. Uh, one is smegma, and the other is from their armpits. Um, when they feel threatened, they exude an incredibly powerful and noxious odor from their armpits, uh, as gorillas do. And the stench is really unbelievable, unmistakable. I right. know that Indian people believe that he's a uh, brother, and that's how they view him. Um, and as an anthropologist, what I study is the culture that holds this animal in high regard in many different forms. And so seeing Bigfoot through their eyes is where the anthropology comes from, where you're not judgmental, you're not trying to make their stories fit um, my view, my um, view of the world. I want to see it through their eyes and how... Um, they've had a relationship with this animal or this brother for 10,000 years, if not longer. And what can those stories tell us about that relationship and what it is and what he is and what can he do? Well, I think that that brings me to a, que a core question I had when I was reading about your book, Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, is that there are some Native traditions that think of uh, Sasquatch as a cannibal, and I thought that was interesting because that would have to, by by definition, would put Bigfoot in the same category as us, because otherwise it wouldn't be a cannibal, it would just be another predator, it would be some species, you know, as a predator. Um, but in order for it to be a cannibal, that would, that would, it would require us to be in the same club. So, and which group was that, by the way, that, that thought of Sasquatch as a, as a cannibal? Um, almost all of them. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Seminole Indian tribe. Bigfoot is well known to them. In fact, they believe that there is more than one. One is called Stichupko, which means tall man. And uh, he's a, a tall Bigfoot-like creature uh, with grayish brown hair and uh, about nine to ten feet tall in that area. Uh, there is also one that uh, appears usually in the morning time called Ihoza which means uh, forget, and that's what this being or creature, animal, makes you do, is forget. Although woven into their legends, the Indians believe that Bigfoot is a real flesh and blood creature that also has hypnotic powers. They have magic. Magic able to disappear. Because even when the non-natives, they chase this thing, 
I noticed that the natives, that the Indian people, when we see it, we kind of get scared of it. But yet, we don't bother it. He lives underground, and uh, he comes out only at night time. He, he, he doesn't, if he, you know, put a light on them, they'll, you know, they'll disappear in the woods. They even had helicopters, you know, to, to look for it. They never, they never did find it. And they said, uh, it just disappeared in the, in the river bottom. And so it knows it's in danger, and it uses its magic to get away. A part of a hypnosis stage that it puts people in, and to where it could be standing right there in front of you, and you still wouldn't see it. An invisible force that some believe has the power to paralyze. Survivors of tiger attacks have spoken of being paralyzed, frozen to the spot. But Elizabeth von Mugenthaler is the first scientist to take it seriously. She's a bioacoustician researching animal communication. She believes the tiger's secret weapon is a gateway to an uncharted area of science. It's only been in the last 20 years that we've started to be even begin to understand some of the marvelous capabilities that animals have. The tiger's roar and the infrasound that it contains can be used to paralyze their prey and cause confusion in their victims. So the tiger can pounce and kill its victim. Perhaps the next most compelling evidence for the existence of Sasquatch are the numerous eyewitness accounts. Using mapping technology, MonsterQuest will look for sighting hotspots. What we're exploring here is whether there's a correlation between average annual precipitation and Sasquatch sightings. Frank Orr is a geographic analyst. Using Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, he'll be charting all of the eyewitness accounts since the Patterson footage was shot. First thing that jumps out right away, was surprising to me, is the number of sightings actually in the eastern United States, something I wasn't expecting. Um, we see a lot of sightings in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and then as we move across the Intermontane West, you can see the sightings become more and more limited. The map shows the number of sightings per square mile. The areas in dark blue have the highest concentration of reports. And one of the densest areas is near Bluff Creek. We now have um, a map, um, we have a, a set of data points across the country that we can compare um, apples to apples to the precipitation values. Or adds the next layer which shows average annual precipitation. This is particularly important because a high density of rainfall would be crucial for the survival of a large primate in the wild. The areas with the most rainfall are represented by blue and green those with the least, by dark orange and red. And it really is quite striking, uh, the fact that when you pass this line, kind of this, this 100th meridian here, where the, the average annual rainfall really starts to drop off, you see uh, a, a very limited number of sightings. It seems like a very strong correlation between sightings and rainfall, as you can see indicated by the dark blue areas. So we've, we've sort of seen, at least looking at the map, that sightings seem to occur where there's more annual average precipitation. Or examines the data in bar chart form. About 80 to 85 percent of, of areas across the United States experience something less than about 50 inches of, of precipitation annually. Um, if you look at the, the same bar chart uh, for the sighting locations, you can see that most sighting locations actually tend to be in areas that are anywhere between 50 and 100 inches of precipitation a year. So it is true that most sighting locations occur where there is more annual average precipitation. 
And I think GIS is a great tool to use to look at the distribution of sighting locations to attempt to correlate it with other environmental factors um, to hopefully come up with some sort of a predictive model um, to, to help guide us in determining where uh, sightings are most likely to occur and if there are people who want to make use of that information to target their studies, I think that would be a great use of the technology. Now, I do not permit firearms in the field. I don't feel it's necessary. I feel that if a creature like this wants you, your firearms are nothing more than an iron teddy bear, because he's gonna get you. Southwestern Oregon. In 1874, Hunter Elijah Davidson discovered a large cave, leading to a 500-acre network of underground tunnels and caverns. Known as the Oregon Caves, the ancient subterranean structure is one of the few marble caves in the world. Some believe this underground world is home to the Sasquatch creatures that have been reported in this area by Native Americans for hundreds of years. There are a number of sightings of these creatures in caves, a number of explorers hearing very strange animalistic screams coming uh, from these caves and seeing sort of shadowy lumbering creatures within them. You know, if you're a large flesh and blood animal, seven to eight feet tall, certainly you're gonna be out hunting all day to, to feed. But at night, potentially, you know, with Bigfoot hunters out there, regular hunters, other wild animals, you need to be careful. The ideal location to hide out would be underground. So, you know, maybe that's another reason we haven't found Bigfoot. Instead of looking around us, maybe we should be looking below us. These cabin systems that exist uh, worldwide have not been fully explored. <laughs> In fact, probably a very small percentage of them have been even discovered. What could exist down there? Could we have a whole system of life forms that exist down there that we have yet to identify? You have fish that never see light. You have insect species. There's the possibility of a complete potential infrastructure for Bigfoot to survive on. Perhaps, Bigfoot is one of these life forms. But no one sees Sasquatches going on highways, paths, and forests moving back and forth. If we're dealing with non-human intelligence, and non-humans made them to do work on this planet, maybe there's a tunnel system. And that might explain why you could have them in Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, California, all over. One thing that's always intrigued me as well about Bigfoot is this description of a musky sulfurish type smell that's often associated with close encounters. You know, the Christian version of the devil and fire and brimstone and that sulfur type smell tends to be associated with the subterranean world or hell. So is there a connection possibly between the idea of subterranean devils, if you will, or Lucifer and that sulfur smell and that sulfur smell with Bigfoot? Is it possible that a race of subterranean creatures has been living beneath the Earth's surface without our knowledge? If so, might Bigfoot have been interacting with us for thousands of years? In ancient Greek myths, 
we find references to the troglodytes. These hairy, beastly looking creatures that lived underground that sometimes were extremely terrifying, but sometimes they also were very wise and taught mankind in various disciplines. Now, according to the ancient legends, the troglodytes are believed to have descended from the sky. Obviously, they were hiding out somewhere that was inaccessible to our ancestors. They wanted to keep their presence a secret. There are multiple stories that actually talk about explorations into these tunnels where sometimes people never returned. In particular, a six-year-old boy named Dennis Martin. Describe that case and the strange circumstances around it. So if there's one case, probably in both books, I know better than any, it's a Dennis Martin case. And once you read about him and how he disappeared, it, it'll strike a chord in any parent out there. Uh, Dennis was with his dad, his grandpa, and his brother over a Father's Day weekend. And they decided to, they lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, June 14, 69, they decided to go up to an area called Spence Field on the top of the Rockies along the Appalachian Trail. And they hike in a short distance to this field, and it looks like a field, surrounded by trees and things, but there's a field right here. And uh, the Martin boys are out running around, and the grandparents and the, the grandpa and the dad are just sitting there on the field. And... and in these stories, every once in a while, you're going to see that I write about a very strange coincidence that happens. And as they're sitting on this field, a family walks up, just pretty weird to begin with because he had to hike into this area. A family walks up, and they sit down, and they have kids too. And they say, oh, hi there. My name is so-and-so Martin. Mr. Martin looks at him and goes, our name is the Martins too. And they said, well, our, can our kids sit down and play together? And he says, Absolutely. So they sit down and make small talk, and in the meantime, the kids are running around the field. After a little bit, the kids decide that they're going to play hide-and-seek. Well, Dennis is one of the smaller kids, and Mr. Martin is a very, very smart man. And I've had the pleasure to meet him and speak with him. And uh, he, he is aware of what's going on around him at all times. And he watched his son during this hide-and-seek game hide behind a bush 50, 60 feet away from him. And after 30, 40, 50 seconds, everybody comes out, hide-and-seek game is over, his son doesn't come out. He gets up and he walks over to the bush, and his son's not there. And he runs two miles down the Appalachian Trail as fast as he can, and he doesn't see anything. And he comes back, and his, grand, his uh, dad already knows what's going on. People are looking for Dennis. Red flags are going up. He sends his dad down the trail to get Park Service assistance. And uh, within an hour or two hours, there's 100 guys up there, and they're looking. make a long story short, within a couple of days, there's several thousand people covering that park. And what evolves from this is one of the most unusual stories you will ever hear. And 
Part of the fault in what's happened here, I, I lay directly on the media in Knoxville, and it's still ongoing. And that is, is that they covered the story from what the Park Service or whoever was pulling the punches here wanted them to, but they didn't tell the whole story. And that is, is that uh, when Dennis disappeared, they, the Park Service employees and the Rangers, they weren't carrying guns at that time. They hadn't been authorized to. Yet the second day after Dennis disappears, unknowing to anybody, it's like the, the invasion forces arrived and 100 Green Berets fly into the park in helicopters and establish a base there, away from the Park Service people and away from other searchers. And they set up a communications post just for them. And they search by themselves. Dwight McCarter was the head tracker for the Park Service then and recently retired, and I interviewed him as well. And Dwight said, yeah, Dave, I don't know why they didn't communicate with us. I don't know why they didn't search with us. And I don't know why they were carrying guns. But they went out and searched while we were searching, and about 100 of them. And as the people are searching, during those first hours that Dennis was gone, first few hours, a family was down below them at about 2,000, 2,500 feet in an area called Cades Cove. And they'd asked rangers where they could go to see animal life. The rangers told them an area called Rowan's Creek. And they walk up into this area, an entire family, and the boy says, Dad, look, there's a bear up there running amongst the trees. And the dad looks up and says, son, that's not a bear. That looks like, almost looks like a man. And they watch this thing dart behind trees as though it doesn't want to be seen. Simultaneously, they hear the loudest scream they've ever heard in their life. And this family's name, their last name was called the Key family. Keys don't know that a child's been missing. They just... They just are walking through the park. So they get back in their car and they go home because they don't know anything's happened. The next day they read about the Martin disappearance in the paper and they read that the FBI is on scene monitoring this case. Well, the Keys feel that what they saw was extremely important. And they call the FBI and they say, hey, we'll meet you at the park and we'll tell you and show you what we saw. All right, six-year-old Dennis Martin disappears June 1969 in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, Green Berets are called in. Another family, the Key family, sees something pretty weird flitting around in the trees. Pick up the story from there, Dave. So the Keys call the FBI, and the FBI says, no, don't come to the park. We'll come to you. Now, first of all, as an investigator, I want to see what they saw. I want to understand if it's plausible what they saw could be involved with Dennis or not. So the statement was, was odd to begin with. So the FBI agent and a Park Service investigator go out and meet the family and they tell them the story. And the FBI agent appears to be calling the shots on everything. And he tells, he comes back and he tells the Park Service, ah, it's nothing, don't worry about it, it's not, not possible, not plausible. And Dwight McCarter hears the story, and he tells me, Dave, it was plausible, it was likely, it was the best lead we had. And I said, really? He says, well, it was within the guidelines of, of plausibility and time and distance, and the FBI agent says it wasn't. So a couple days go by, and nobody hears anything about this, including Mr. Martin, who had been given instructions that he would be updated on anything close to to a hint of evidence he'd be told about. Well, he was never told. And what happened was is that a newspaper guy was given, got onto the story because the Key family saw that it was given no press. Nobody followed up with him. It's like it got swept under the carpet. The Keys call the press, and the press goes out and meets with him, and they tell the press the story. So the press comes back to the FBI and the Park Service and says, well, is this true? Why weren't we made it aware of it? Blah, blah, blah. And the FBI agent and the Park Service give the press an admonishment. We don't know what that was, but I'll tell you what the eventuality of it is. And they're told it, it doesn't fit, but, you know, you can run the story, go ahead, but it's not anything to worry about. Well, Mr. Martin hears from McCarter, no, this is within reason. So they walk the distance, and they find out that not only is that within plausibility, it's well within the guidelines of what could be real, and it's the, best, it's the best lead they had. They didn't have anything. 
So the, Mr. Martin's getting a little upset because he doesn't think that the Park Service is making the call on this. And he started to feel right away that his son got kidnapped. And he didn't mind telling people that. He goes, I know my son. I know how, how, how fast he can move. I know his mentality. This isn't him. There's no way he could have gotten away like as fast as he did without help, blah, blah, blah. So you start, they start keep going with the search, and there's 3,000 people there. It goes on for three weeks, and it rains every day for two weeks. From the time Dennis disappeared, two weeks later, it rained nonstop. So it seems pretty unusual. We make a Freedom of Information Act request. We get the documents. We interview McCarter. And from reading the statements in the paper about the Key family and hearing from McCarter, the last person I wanted to talk to was Mr. Martin. But everybody told me he doesn't talk to anybody. So every once in a while as a policeman, if you want to, if you want to talk to somebody, sometimes it's best just to cold call him. Just go knock on his door. Don't, don't give him time to think about it. Be polite. Be respectful. And that's, that's what myself and another researcher did. Um, we went and found Mr. Martin, knocked on his door. He came to the door. I was very humble. I said, Mr. Martin, I've been researching your case for several years regarding your son. I probably know more about it than everyone but you. And if you please give me five minutes of your time and just answer a couple of questions, I'd be eternally grateful. And you could see tears dwell, start to come up in this guy's eyes. And he looked in the house and he said, you know, I made a promise to my wife I wouldn't talk about this anymore because it's ruined our lives. And I live with the hell of knowing that my son isn't here with me. And I just, I just can't talk about it. And I said, hey, I came all the way from California. Can you just answer a few questions for me, please? And he looked inside at his wife. He closed the door, and he stepped onto the porch, and he gave us about 20 minutes. And the man was very polite, and he is still hurt very hard by this. So I went through a series of questions, and I said, uh, one thing I asked him is that when his son went behind the bush playing hide-and-seek, did you hear, smell, feel anything odd? He said, nothing. And I said, how about your other son that was there? He said, he, he heard, felt, smelled nothing. He said, it was like everything was normal. And I said, is there any chance that your son could have gotten away from you that quick? He said, zero chance. There's no way. And if you look at pictures of Mr. Martin when his son disappeared and today, he's still in phenomenal shape. I, I, I believe what he's saying. And uh, so we started to talk about the key family observation, and his eyes lit up. He says, Dave, you know about this. I said, yeah, I've researched it a lot. and uh, It seems like that was probably your best lead. He said, yes. I said, well, why wasn't, follow why wasn't it followed up? He said, Dave, I thought the Park Service was in charge of their park. But he said, somebody else is making the calls here. It's, it wasn't, wasn't the Park Service. They were just following somebody else's orders, and I don't think it was coming from the Park Service. He says, the FBI agent said it wasn't possible to make that distance, yet McCarter and I hiked it in easily that time. And one of the last questions I asked him was, I said, you know, in an investigation, I always ask people, what should I know that wasn't publicly available but would help me understand what happened? He goes, oh, wow. He goes, people have never asked me that. He says, the first thing is a key family observation. He says, you obviously know what was printed in the paper. I said, yeah. He says, you want to know what wasn't printed in the paper is that the key family saw something running behind the trees. Well, that something was carrying something on its shoulder, but the press wouldn't print it. Oh, my eyes lit up. My eyes lit up. I said, "You're kidding." He says, "No." And I said, "Well, did they ever did they ever address that to you?" No, they just swept it under the rug. They didn't want to deal with it. And I and he said, "And then you know the FBI agent that you've been talking to me about?" I said, "Yeah." And I said, "Well, from the feeling is." He said he was just monitoring this case. And Mr. Martin said, no, he, he was really actively involved. And it, it was possible from all the discussions I had with people, including McCarter, it seemed like he was the one making the calls for some odd, very odd reason. And um, Mr. Martin said, well, that FBI agent, he was the same one on other children's disappearances up here. And, and I even named the disappearances to Mr. Martin. I said, on this, 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 he said, yes. And he says, do you know what ever happened to that agent? I said, no. He says he committed suicide. And for the people that are listening, that may not mean a lot to them. 
But once you understand the way the FBI manages their people, is that everything you learn in an investigation, you cannot release to anybody else without approval from a supervisor. And you're, everything has to be held confidential, confidentially. And when somebody, an agent, is monitoring a case, they're writing case notes and reports and sending it to Virginia. And those report files are then reviewed by a profiler and placed into other files that have significant other meaning to what you may be investigating. And if there's an agent in the field that's investigating something similar, he's given information just like that. So he can work it with a more educated perspective. The implication being is that this agent was obviously told something, and this is what Mr. Martin was getting at without it being said, he knew something that obviously hurt him. 